Welcome to the second season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. It always amazes me how when I start researching an episode that occurred miles away, it twists and turns and I find it has a connection close to my home on Vancouver Island. This is another one of those episodes. In 1971, 24-year-old Gary Hanlon was living in Courtney on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. On a hot summer's evening, a young woman was out for a Sunday stroll when Gary forced her into his car. He drove to a logging road and pulled her out. She fought hard, but felt something sharp pressed into her back. He forcibly removed her clothes and sexually assaulted her. She feared he was going to kill her, but then he allowed her to get dressed, and on the drive to her home, he asked, if he could see her again. She said no. She picked him out of a police lineup and he was charged with rape, indecent assault, and assault with intent to commit rape. He was found guilty and sentenced to five and a half years. But as so often happens, Gary got out of prison early. Four years later, in 1975, Sherry Herbert... A single mother was raising her 12-year-old daughter, Catherine Mary, and three sons in the small town of Matsqui, an hour east of Vancouver. It had been a rough year. Her 10-year-old son, Donald, had accidentally drowned the previous summer. But Sherry had a big heart and took in a 16-year-old girl she'd encountered living on the street. When the teenager started dating Gary... Sherry was pleased that she'd found someone. On the afternoon of September 24, Kathy and her mom had a huge argument. Kathy dressed in a mauve blouse with matching corduroy pants, white running shoes, and a black and white coat. With her curly brown hair and freckled face, she left the house and went to her friends. She stayed for dinner and afterwards was walking home when she met another friend. He checked his watch and noticed it was almost 9 p.m. He doubled her on his bike for a short distance, then dropped her off within view of her house. He saw Kathy walking towards her home as he turned and headed home. Kathy never made it home. Gary was parked on the side of the road in his car, He drove up to her, and recognizing him, she got in. They drove for seven miles, crossed the highway, onto twisting back roads, and eventually down a dirt road. He pulled over and attacked Kathy. She was five feet tall and barely a hundred pounds, but was athletic and fought back hard. He grabbed a tire iron, raised it up and brought it down with all his force, striking her on the side of her head, fracturing her skull and breaking her jaw. The Vancouver Sun reported that Gary discarded Kathy's body, fully clothed in a wooded area near a burial site on First Nations land. Near a clearing where a house had burnt to the ground, He hid her body under a sheet of old plywood. Kathy's mother reported her daughter missing. The police and members of the armed forces in Chilliwack searched the area around their house. Investigators quickly felt that she had been picked up by someone in a car. But it would have been someone she knew because Kathy did not hitchhike and wouldn't get into a stranger's car. Two months later, two men from the Matsqui First Nations were gathering firewood when they found Kathy's badly decomposed body. 
Her lower body had been preserved under the sheet of plywood. However, the upper body had been submerged in water. Nature and time had long eroded any possible clues. At her graveside, her mother Shara promised her that she would never give up, that Kathy's killer would be found, and she would get justice. Kathy's autopsy report was little more than half a page and revealed that she had died from the blow to her head. Although her underwear was missing, it could not be determined if she had been sexually assaulted. Investigators returned Kathy's clothing to her family, and they were buried with her. Police quickly had a suspect, but would not name him, because they had no evidence to tie him to her murder. Two and a half years later in Merritt, B.C., single mother Madeline Lanero had moved with her two sons and two daughters from Oroville, Washington, to a rural property near Nicola Lake. Madeline was a social worker, her sons did well in sports, and her 12-year-old daughter Monica Jack was quiet but smart and had many friends. She had long auburn hair, brown eyes, and a tiny frame at only 4 foot 8. She had just got a bike from her dad a few weeks earlier and was excited to be riding. On Saturday, May 6, 1978, it was her youngest daughter's seventh birthday, so Madeline allowed the children to fix themselves whatever they wanted for breakfast. CBC News reported that her older brother Glenn was going to a party that night, and Monica wanted to tag along. But he said no, because his mother wouldn't have approved. Monica then asked her mother if she could ride her bike into town, 12 miles down Highway 5, a ride she had never done before. Her mother said yes. That afternoon, Monica dressed in a pink top with flowers, brown corduroy pants, and blue running shoes, waved goodbye to her mother, and rode off, spending the day shopping with her cousin, Afterwards, the girls hopped on their bikes and rode the first five miles together. Then her cousin turned off to go home, and Monica continued on the highway alone for the last seven miles. Her mother had driven to town earlier to pick up supplies for an overnight fishing trip, and at 7.45 p.m., she spotted Monica riding just a half mile from their house. They stopped and chatted for a few minutes, then she got back into her car, she would see Monica at home in a few minutes. But Monica never made it home. As she neared the gravel pullout along Nicola Lake, she spotted a green truck and camper. Gary stepped out of his truck and grabbed Monica. She screamed. He forced her into the camper and stuffed her into the bathroom. He threw her bike down the embankment, then sped off down the highway. He turned off on a narrow logging road and headed up Swakam Mountain, the same mountain that was named after Monica's ancestors. He pulled off the road, removed her clothes, and sexually assaulted young Monica. Then he strangled her and discarded her body behind a log. On Sunday afternoon, when Glenn returned home from the party, his brother and sister told him that Monica hadn't come home. Then, his mother returned from her fishing trip and immediately phoned police, then friends and family. Glenn told his mother that everything was going to be okay, that Monica would be coming home. He walked along the highway looking for any sign of his sister. In the gravel pullout near the lake, he spotted her bike down the embankment. When police arrived, they knew something was terribly wrong. Four days, searchers walked the mountains looking for Monica. A witness told police that he had seen a man with a camper truck standing in the pullout around 8 p.m. and that he heard cries a few minutes later 
and thought it was a domestic dispute, so he didn't investigate. Police knew she had likely been abducted by a stranger, and they had a suspect in mind, but no evidence. Four months later, Gary attacked again. A young woman was hitchhiking near Hope when Gary offered her a ride. She was heading further north, and he said he could drive her part of the way. They drove for a half hour before he pulled over at a highway rest stop on the premise of a washroom break. Instead, once they got out of the car, he grabbed her from behind, hooked his arm around her neck, and dragged her a hundred feet into the woods. She fought hard as he was squeezing her neck, trying to strangle her. She tried to scream, but couldn't make a sound. He sexually assaulted her twice, but then she managed to break free. Wearing only a shirt, sweater, and one sock, she ran for her life, fleeing towards the highway. A couple spotted her and stopped. They saw Gary's car leave and noted the license plate number. They used their CB radio to put out a call to others in the area to be on the lookout for his car. The next day, police found Gary hiding under the bed in his apartment in nearby New Westminster. They arrested him. The woman was able to identify him in a police lineup. At Gary's trial, the jury needed only 30 minutes to find him guilty. The prosecutor requested the maximum penalty of life in prison. However, he was sentenced to 18 years. Monica's case went cold. So did Kathy's. In the summer of 1995, 17 years after she was snatched off her bike, Monica's remains were found, stumbled upon by forestry workers. It took eight months for her skull and bones to be identified using DNA and dental records. Monica finally went home to her family. Police announced that foul play was strongly suspected and that they had a suspect. He did not live in the area, but there was insufficient evidence to charge him. The Vancouver Sun reported that two days before her funeral, friends and relatives hiked to the spot on Swakam Mountain where Monica had been found and held a ceremony to release her spirit. That night, her mother sat in her living room next to her coffin with a picture of her and sang Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. The next day, Monica's father rose early and loaded his pickup with wood and drove to the graveyard on the reserve. He parked among the rows of white crosses his brother split the wood while he arranged the kindling and lit a fire. He added wood and watched the flames burn hotter, thawing the ground for his only daughter's burial. She would no longer be alone. Generations of her family would surround her. It is not known exactly when Gary was released from prison, but in 2004, he was known to be living in Minden, Ontario, where he was charged with a traffic violation. In a 2009 documentary by David Ridgen, produced by CBC's Cold Case Files, called A Garden of Tears, he interviewed Kathy's mother, and she revealed that in 1980, police sent two handwritten letters that had been written to Kathy to their forensic lab for examination. Years later, the police confirmed in a letter that the handwriting had been compared to a person of interest in the case, but was inconclusive. Then, they told her that the letters had since been lost. Apparently, when the Matsqui police amalgamated forces in the early 90s, the files and photos from Kathy's case disappeared. 
Sherry suffered another loss when her son William died by suicide after Kathy's murder. She moved to Acreage in Chilliwack and once a year held retreats for grieving mothers. She hired a private investigator in 2012 and offered a $10,000 reward for new evidence that would lead them to a suspect. But what Sherry and Madeline didn't know is that police hadn't given up on their daughter's murders. They hadn't been forgotten. They suspected Gary shortly after their disappearances, but didn't have enough evidence to charge him. So after 35 years, they set out to get it. Undercover officers in Minden, Ontario, set up an elaborate Mr. Big sting operation. The undercover agent's fictitious crime operation of debt collection and loan sharking provided Gary with jobs that paid him almost $12,000 to smuggle cigarettes or repossess cars. Very quickly, they had become like family to Gary. It was nine months into their undercover operation when an undercover officer posed as the big boss and told them that his people did a deep dive into his background and discovered that he was involved with Monica's murder. The boss told Gary that police had DNA evidence and were coming for him. Then, the boss offered to make it go away. He could set up a former employee who was dying to take the fall for the murder. But to do that, he needed all the details. With a hidden camera recording everything, Gary confessed to Monica's murder. The officer asked Gary if he'd ever told anyone, and he replied, Nobody knows, unless you're taping me. Gary also confessed to Kathy's murder and traveled with officers from Ontario to Matsqui to the heavily wooded area and pointed out a spot within 600 feet from where he dumped Kathy's body. He also took them to the highway where he had snatched Monica. In December 2014, Gary Hanlon was charged with two counts of first-degree murder. He pled not guilty. Sherry kept the vow she made at her daughter's graveside all those years ago. Kathy's killer had been caught, and she was going to get justice. But sadly, Sherry didn't live to see the day. She passed away in November 2016. Gary would go to trial for Monica's murder first, then Kathy's. It would take four years for his first trial to begin in the fall of 2018. His lawyer argued that his confession had been coerced. Monica's sister and brother testified at her trial along with their mother. When Madeline took the stand, she was handed Monica's last school picture. The same photo was then handed to Gary. CBC News reported that as a witness, Madeline wasn't allowed to be in the courtroom during the trial, but once she testified, she could remain. When she finished her testimony, she made her way from the witness stand and sat down with her family directly behind Gary. How her eyes must have burned into the back of his head. After 11 weeks, the jury found the 71-year-old guilty of first-degree murder, and a judge sentenced him to life in prison. Then, in a surprise twist, the judge dismissed the charges against him for Kathy's murder, explaining that there wasn't enough evidence. Although Gary had confessed, some of the details did not match up. With the evidence and the ones that did, he could have learned from the TV documentaries that he'd watched about her murder. Whereas the documentaries didn't discuss Monica, and Gary knew details of her murder that had never been publicly released. At the sentencing, Monica's brother Glenn summed it up beautifully saying that he wished he'd had more time with her. Because in the end, that is all what we want. 
more time. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Christy Wilson. She was a gambler and liked to win, but she never imagined gambling with her life. That night, she crossed paths with a rapist at the blackjack table. She walked out into the cold, dark night air, never to be seen again. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast Addict, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Also learn about upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. To support Murder in 20, please like and share, and feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them, we're not shy. Until next week, stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.